so the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, which is ours because of his Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As has become obvious this morning, our theme, our focus is the righteous life. And John's letter, I believe uh, that section that Daniel read, uh, highlights a few of the ingredients, if you will, of that righteous life that has been given to us. First of all, that we are incredibly loved by God. What a blessing, what a promise, what a reality that is for each one of us in different ways. And because of that love of God, he had sent his son, Jesus Christ, so now our sins indeed are forgiven washed away, taken care of by way of his death on the cross. And then, too, we have been adopted. We have been adopted as God's beloved children. What a gift, what a reality, what a promise for each one of us. And then, finally, that we are called or instructed, yes, invited, if you will, to practice a righteous life, to live a righteous life to his glory and praise. And so with that in mind, I want to begin with a little story that a pastor, Steve Edding, uh, told some years ago. It goes like this. He started by saying, imagine that you were uh, part of a conversation or listening in, eavesdropping on a conversation in Nazareth, on a Nazareth playground some 2,000 years ago. And there are this little group of boys who are engrossed in some very important discussion, at least that they think for themselves is important. One boy says, my dad is better than your dad. He shouts to the other youngsters because he's a farmer and if he wasn't there as a farmer, you wouldn't have a whole lot to eat. Another boy responds and says, well, my dad's a tool maker and if your dad didn't have the tools to do the farming, you wouldn't, he wouldn't get too much done. And besides that, he's the strongest dad in town. The third boy came back and said, yes, your dad may be the strongest man in town, but my dad is the smartest man in town, said the son of the rabbi. He knows everything. Well, finally, the three boys looked at the fourth kid in the group, and one of them said, hey, Jesus, how about your dad? Jesus looked each one of them right in the eye and said, my dad died. Well, that's pretty hard to top, isn't it? And yet it is kind of a, a neat thing in our life if perhaps we were blessed by being the, the son or daughter of someone maybe kind of special or, or someone sort of important in our community or town. But to be the child of God himself, that's incredible. It's incredible. And that's exactly what we hear this morning when John is telling us, as he told the people of his day, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. Now there's another short story that I'd like to share that might help illustrate that again, what John wrote and what John has said to us this morning. Several kids were giving another ch little boy a hard time because they found out that he was an adopted child. And the boy sat there passively as they taunted him with their remarks and even insults were being thrown his way. And finally, after they had exhausted their comments about his being adopted, he replied very quietly in this manner. He said, yes, you know, your parents had to take you. They didn't have any choice. But my parents loved me so much that they came and picked me out to be their own very special son. Well, dear friends, that is exactly what Jesus is saying to you and me this morning as we gather here once again. He said, you did not choose me. I have chosen you. That's from John's Gospel. That's the great truth, the wonder of being a child of God. We weren't born that way, of course, and we do not have a right to that claim because of sin in our life that has torn us away from that beautiful father-childlike relationship that was meant for us right from the beginning. But in the beginning, we might say Adam and Eve were really runaway children from God's special place in that garden by disobeying God. And humanity has been, in fact, running away ever since. From the time we were born, we too were, in fact, spiritual orphans, if you will, homeless, without love, without hope, really without the promise that we now have and know. But the Father's love for us was so great that he sent our brother, the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring us back into the family. And Jesus, we might say, became a runaway himself in this world. He became an orphan on the cross one forsaken by his father, who literally went to hell and back for us, to win us the forgiveness 
the right of being adopted as God's children. By his death, by his resurrection, Jesus earned the privilege for you and me to call God Father. An honor that we cannot claim, that we can only claim by faith in his son. We have been reconciled to God as wayward children, picked out as special by God's love and adopted to be part of his eternal family. Wow. In fact, we might say that the mission of the church, our mission, is to be a divine adoption agency, to reach out to the fatherless of our world and to tell them about the gospel of adoption and reconciliation. God has given us, the church, some very powerful instruments by which to affect this adoption process. None other than his word and again the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. We might say that the word is an invitation to the homeless world. Hey, you out there, there's a loving father out there looking for you and in Jesus he wants to take you home to be with him forever. By the way, if you happen to have your baptismal certificate someplace that you can occasionally take a look at it, it can serve as a reminder of your own personal adoption. Remember that through water and the word, you were baptized into God's family. And once again this morning, we come as a family when we share in this supper, the Lord's Supper, his holy communion. We stand or we kneel here as the united family at this table to eat and drink the very body and blood of the Lord, which is for us a visible guarantee of our status as forgiven children of God, of our Heavenly Father. Now, the God, that God, by word and sacrament, has taken the initiative, he has taken the initiative, if you will, of adopting us into his family. And as a result of that, we possess some rights, some privileges, if you will, as his children. Right off the bat, that means we can look forward to a great inheritance that is ours, already now, in fact. But it's an interesting kind of topsy-turvy inheritance. It's not an inheritance that we get as would be true in the world where a parent dies, where the father dies. No, it's inheritance we receive when we die. What a gift, what a blessing, what a promise. The gift of eternal life waiting for us. Besides that, a terrific byproduct of our adoption as children of God is that we get a whole new family. We call it the church. Sharing God as our father makes us brothers and sisters, siblings, if you will, under God's grace and in his mercy. We who are so diverse in so many different ways, yet we are bound together by the saving blood that was shed for us by our Lord Jesus Christ. We do need to hear this again and again, dear friends. We need to hear this good news about being adopted children of our Heavenly Father. Because we live in a very impersonal age, an age in which oftentimes we may be identified more by, say, a social security number, or a driver's license number, or a telephone number, or maybe a credit card number. But you know what? God knows us by name. He calls us by name. What a gift, what a promise, what a certainty, what a reality that is. We are his children, we belong to that family that he has created by faith in his son. And so as children of the Father, we both want to and are enabled to love and forgive now one another. We are empowered to live righteously. In the fourth chapter of John's letter, we read these words. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That's the righteous life. Here is now where we are beginning to see the evidence of that righteous life. Here is where we begin to see what I'd call the horizontal bar of the cross. And if Steve would show a, a picture of a cross here for us. If any of you have ever attended some of pastor's Bible classes, you are well familiar with the fact that he often uses illustrations to explain a point or his lesson. And one of his favorite illustrations is the cross. A very familiar symbol, of course, to all of us as God's people. The vertical bar, if you will, or the post of that cross helps to show our relationship with God the Father. An illustration that shows the right relationship between God and us. It tells how God restores us as fallen sinners to that right relationship with him. Rescuing us from sin and death, restoring us to life itself. I can't help but think of Daniel's illustration here. That foundation that we have 
in that vertical post, if you will, of the cross. Our rightness with God is all God's doing. He did it all. It is finished, as Christ said. He recreates us fallen sinners. He transforms us into his chosen children through this act of bestowing a right relationship with himself by hanging there for us. But now the horizontal bar of that cross shows or illustrates the righteousness of our performance in living out that vertical relationship, if you will, to which God has called us in and through Christ Jesus. It becomes visually obvious that that horizontal bar or relationship cannot stay in place, or for that matter, even exist in God's sight without that vertical beam or relationship being in place. This, dear friends, is our Christian life. It rests on God's gracious disposition and attitude and expression of his favor, of his mercy toward us. His grace is sufficient for us, for his power is made perfect in our weaknesses. In our weaknesses, his power and favor of his love are now revealed as we live out that gift of righteousness horizontally with one another. And so the righteous life may be summarized in saying that the believer in Christ Jesus loves his fellow man. We love one another because of what Christ has done. We want to do good to those whom God has done good, to do with God's help the works of light and love in a rather dark and at times hateful world in order that people may see the good and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Not us, not to us be the glory, but to him. It is not the teaching of scripture that works or righteous living is unimportant or unnecessary, no way. Of course, they do not save or redeem us. They are not the door to heaven. That's Christ. His work has redeemed us. His work has opened the door for us to be certain of our heavenly home. But scripture also teaches and the conviction that works as they flow out of faith in doing the will of God are necessary as well. In fact, they are inevitable on our part. For faith binds us to God, Love, in turn, binds us then to one another. God's love creates in our love uh, to him and also then to our fellow man. Now, this is not to be a selfish or self-seeking love, but it's a love that seeks the good for our neighbor and of our neighbor, of our brother and sister in Christ, the good of our church, the good of our nation, the good, if you will, of the world. The world needs to see the righteous life that we have been given in Christ Jesus. St. Paul speaks of this righteous life with these words. There are many places in scripture that you can find instruction regarding this matter. But this is a beautiful one, I believe, that Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that, may, that it may benefit those who are listening. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption that adoption. God, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. And here it comes. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God has forgiven you. Praise God. So let us remember who we are. Let us remember this morning and throughout the week and throughout the rest of our life who we are according to John's word in our epistle reading this morning. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. What newness, what freshness blows through our lives as we see ourselves as God sees us. What potential for God's action being unleashed in us and through us as we open our hearts to let the Spirit work His righteous will in us. We no longer need to just talk of the obstacles and the barriers, but rather now we can talk about the possibilities and the, pros and the promises that we know are ours and also the world's. We no longer need to hold back and hesitate to live that righteous life, but surge forward with spontaneity like, yes, like playful children, if you will. And so our lives of love grow as we join together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And what surpassing joy now crowns our lives when we know that the same Lord Jesus, who held many little children, we believe, to himself when he was here on earth, 
will one day come and gather us up and hold us, if you will, and take us home to be with him and his father. And so what a precious thing for us also to be able to say, for us to also be able to say as did Jesus in that opening story, you know what? God's my dad. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all our understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our worship continues by receiving our gifts and tithes.